JavaScript. Who likes JavaScript? You are very strange people. So, I've had a relationship with JavaScript for more than a decade now. Uh, I've made my peace with it. I, I can't say I, I really like it. I, it. It goes more to the other extreme, but it's what I do for a living, and I'm sort of getting comfy with it. And, but, the thing that, that happened recently is JavaScript got like a standards committee, and um, this committee has actually been, been developing the language and adding new interesting features. So JavaScript has gone from completely horrible to slightly horrible uh, over the past couple of years. And this latest standard that's been actually finished and published is called ES2015. Uh, which used to be called ES6 until they decided that we should now call it by year instead of version number. Um, I'm just going to keep calling it ES6 because I'm slow that way and it's easier to say. Um, and I'd like to tell you today about one of the most exciting features in ES6, one of the, like, in terms of programming language theory, one of the really exciting features about ES6, and that's generators. And I'm so excited about generators, I had to put this GIF in. This is like, um, I'm about as excited about generators as that dog is about the sausage in his mouth. So let me introduce you to Sid. Sid is a beagle from Austin, Texas. And he has, in addition to a huge Instagram following, he has this thing where he likes to just sit and hold uh, food in his mouth. Not eating it, just sitting there, sort of <laughs> enjoying the tension, wagging his tail and, and, and drooling a lot. You can see actually, if you pay close attention, it might be hard to see uh, with the size of the screen, but right before the image loops, right there, right there, you can see him drooling. It's a bit of drool. There you go, you can see it. Amazing. Okay, so let's talk about generators. Or actually, let's do the brief commercial interlude. I'd just, just like to mention, uh, I work for a company called Trading Technologies. Um, we are certainly hiring. We, we exist sort of in, in the intersection of, of, of high finance and JavaScript, and we do really exciting stuff. And if you'd like to come work for us, then we've got a, a booth downstairs, and you should go and check it out. Or look on the internet right there. It'll be totally amazing. So, generators. Um, before I get to generators, I need to show you another feature that sort of leads up to generators called iterators. That's not so much a language feature as, as it's falling off. That's not so much a language feature. I give up on this thing. As it is a standard library feature. And it's still not attached, is it? <laughs> I think my ears are too big for this mic. Right. Um, iterators are sort of an, a defined interface in ES6 for iterating over things that you could iterate over, like, say, an array in, in JavaScript. So if we've got an array called ponies, which has the main six uh, ponies from My Little Pony, as I'm sure you know, um, we can do like this. There are arrays, so we can get, oh yeah, sorry, they're called ponies. We can get things out of them by index, we can get the length of them. And, and from there we can sort of extrapolate how we can walk through the entire um, array. But we can do that using iterators as well. So if you've done any sort of traditional object-oriented language like Java and C-sharp, I'm sure you've seen a lot of iterators before, is essentially, uh, so arrays now have this uh, new method called values, which can get you an iterator of the values inside the array. And this gives us an object, an iterator object, which has one method called next. So we can call next on our new iterator. It gives us an object, 
And the object contains two properties, value and done. The value is the next uh, value, or in this case, the first value out of the array. <coughs> and the done is a flag saying whether we are done iterating or not. And it says false right now, so we're not done. We can walk through the entire thing. We've got Applejack already. We've got Fluttershy, Pinkie Pie, no Pinkie Pie, Rainbow Dash, Rarity, Twilight Sparkle, and done. With no value. So we've iterated. Isn't it exciting? Um, there's also some new syntax for iterators. There's a new for loop. So instead of doing like the weird um, three part C thing that you had to do to, to iterate over an array previously, you could do something like this let i of ponies. And the of thing is new. Um, that's a way of taking anything that can be iterated over, like the ponies array. And it's very simple making a for loop out of this. So we can just like console.log the i and we will get six ponies out. So that's cool. Let's look at the mechanics of this. So I've written my own custom iterator here, or iterable. Uh, arrays can be iterated over, but as long as you have an object that implements the interface of an iterator, or an iterable, then you can roll your own, like I've done here. It's like a very simple stick machine. We've got a counter, C, Increment it when you call next. Then, if it's one, we return Pinkie Pie. If it's two, we return Rainbow Dash. Um, so on, if I can be honest, there are really only two really cool ponies anyway, I've really got those. Um, and you notice this is just an object which has a method called symbol.iterator. Now, symbols are another, another new feature in JavaScript in, in ES6. They're sort of like symbols in Lisp or in Ruby. Um, they are a new thing that can be a key in an object. And for whatever reason, they decided, instead of having like the usual string iterator method name, they, d they decided to go for similar iterator. Um, not sure why, probably a good reason. But we have to implement it like this. Symbol.iterator is a function, a method, which takes no arguments and returns an iterator. The iterator here, is something that has a next method. And that's it. So now we can instantiate this. I can call, say my, my custom iterable is called ponies. I can call ponies symbol.iterator and actually invoke it. So I get a new iterator, I dot next, C will, will now be 1, so it prints Pinkie Pie. Call it again, C will be 2, so it prints Rainbow Dash. After that, it goes to done. So incrementing C every time we call it, but that gives us done. Uh, there's also a new constructor method on the array prototype, which is called from. This is neat. So if you got any kind of, of iterable, you can convert it into an array by calling array of from, and it takes something that's iterable, or an iterator. And ponies is iterable, so that gives us a list of two ponies. And at this point, I'd like to show you a little extension that I made to my, my REPL, my command line prompt here. This is not um, an actual JavaScript feature, it's just for convenience. So I, I made it so that if I start a line with an ampersand, so if I go ponies right now, I'll get uh, an object. But if I go ampersand on, a, on any value, if it's an iterator or an iterable, it will walk it for me and print what comes out of it. So this one gets this pinky pie, then rainbow dash, then done. Keep that in mind. Um, we can also do slightly more interesting things, like I've made this infinity uh, iterable which, as you can see, is fairly straightforward. It outputs numbers, incrementing numbers, incrementing one by one forever. There's no end to it. It never goes into done. So I can go, i is infinity, symbol to iterator, so, and i dot next, it starts at zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on until infinity. 
I can do a full repair rate. Console.log i. And feel free to, to stop me. Um, is this a good idea? <laughs> so the thing is, this is going to crash my browser if I, if I run it because it just takes up all the CPU and, and, and never actually finishes. And because I'm running a Chromebook, that means the browser is the operating system, so it would be very unfortunate if I did that. <laughs> so let's not do that. I can, however, safely do my little Amazon thing. That will actually just take the first 10 values out of it, just so I sort of keep myself from doing anything stupid. And you can see it goes up to 9 and then it stops taking, but it indicates that there are more values that we're not actually done. So that's cool. We can, uh, we can imagine building like a utility library on top of this. Like, for instance, we can have a function take, which takes a number and an iterable and takes only the first x values out of an iterable. So I can go like take 5 out of infinity, because there's only the first 5 actual natural numbers out of infinity. That's cool. And we can, this one we can actually do a for loop over safely. We'll take five out of infinity. infinity. I'm set up. Okay. Right. That gives us five numbers. Cool. We can go further. We can add like a map function. So if we go take five out of infinity, that still gives us that, and we can add on the map. So map, in case you're unaccustomed to functional programming, is a function which takes a function and an iterable, and for each value out of the iterable, it supplies the function to it and returns an iterable of the applied values, which means that I can add a function like i is i plus 5, which is an intensely useful function. And it gets me... Um, a list of numbers that starts with five. And this, <coughs> this uh, interestingly, this composes very well. It doesn't matter which order I do this in, for instance. I can, I, can, I can run this too. It will give me an infinite list starting at five. And I can take five out of that, and I get the same result as previously. So these are actually composable functions, which can be really useful if you think about it. Um, the thing though, look at this. Look at all the code just to do these simple things. All the boilerplate with the symbol.iterator and the object being returned with the next method, and so on. It's, it's not great. It's like writing Java. There's so much boilerplate. Actually, kind of worse than writing Java. So I'd like to actually look at how we can improve that. But first, let's do a sit break. <laughs> There's a sit with a donut. Looking quite pleased. It doesn't actually drool in this one, though. I started out with the best one. But it looks quite content. So, let's try and rewrite this infinity uh, iterator using a generator function instead. This is what they're useful for, the generators. So if I just, I'll keep this for now, remind me to delete this before I try running it, so I don't get the wrong result. Um, so I can instead of this boilerplate thing, I can write infinity is function star. With no arguments. The function star, that's a new keyword in, in ES6. That means we are making a generator function instead of a normal function. A generator function is something that instead of running will return an iterator that you can get results out of. I'm going to show you. So my implementation now looks a little more concise. I start with, let's say, a zero like previously. And this time I can just make an infinite loop. And so to get a value out of a normal function, you would just call return. Yeah, return with a value. 
that will exit the function and get you the value as a result. In generated functions, you can also do this, which uh, finishes the iteration, which results in a done tree and a value. We'll see that later. But you can also do yield. That's a new keyword too. Yield. C++, not the language, but it will yield the value of C and then increment the value of C and then go back into the infinite loop. So what the yield does is it forces the generator function and returns a value to the iterator that we get from calling it. And it's a lot easier if I just show you. So now I can do i is infinity and this time I have to actually call it. So I'm calling the generator function, I get an iterator out. And this one I can do i dot next. First value is zero, then one, then two, then three, and so on until infinity. We don't actually ever hit done true here as well, of course. So these are generator functions. I hope you find the syntax slightly nicer than that whole disgusting thing I did earlier. Um, we can also do, while we're at it, uh, let's try. Uh, the ampersand will work on generators as well, because they just return iterators. Yeah, that still works. Let's do the take function. So the take function on top. That's a generator function, and it takes two arguments, num and iter. Number of, of uh, values we want to take out, and the iterable we want to take them from. So that, that, that's let C is zero, and we need a variable next, and we need a while loop, while C++ plus plus is less than num, incrementing C in and checking if we're done. And if this was a bit hairy, it wasn't bad. So I'm getting the next value out of the iterator, I'm assigning it to the variable next, and then I'm checking if that's done yet. The conciseness of JavaScript. It's not readable, but hey, it works. And we just yield next to value. You win me on that one. Essentially, we take an iterator in, we start putting next on it, and either we're going to get done is true, in which case we are done, or we are going to hit the yield, we're going to get the value out of the, the thing that came out of, of the next call. And we keep going until uh, we have counted up to the number. So let's see if that works. Take five out of infinity. Yeah. So that's the same thing that we did earlier, except half the size and less ugly. Cool. There's also, um, there's also an equivalent math function that we can do a lot nicer. We can bother typing that out. But it's, it's the same principle. Uh, we while until we're done, and we yield um, next value applied to the function that we pass in. So just to verify, map i is i plus 5. Take 5 out of infinity. Ooh. Interesting. Oh, infinity. Applied. There we go. That works. We can do interesting things because this is JavaScript. I plus string log. <laughs> zero log, one log, so obviously. I plus, I know, empty array. Uh, string zero, empty array, that makes sense. <laughs> I love JavaScript. Never know what to expect. <laughs> I plus not a number. It's a number, quite a lot. Guess it's it's not. Uh, okay. So that's great, that works. And then here's where it actually starts getting really interesting. So so far we've used generators to to make like streams of values, which can be really interesting because you noticed uh, with infinity uh, generator that we are doing lazy lists. We're essentially evaluating these streams of values lazily. We, we don't actually compute uh, a value until it's needed, which is a very powerful uh, concept. 
So that's not what we're interested in here today. We're interested in this other feature of generators, which is that you can actually pass values both ways. So I've written this extremely clever function called FIMAP, something that will probably be very useful in, in your own business logic. All right. We start with, with C being zero, then we go into an infinite loop. We yield on C, so the first time we call the, the generator is going to be uh, zero coming out. But notice what we, what we do then. Instead of just yielding, we actually get a value out of the yield and assign that to C. Then we increment C by five and keep going, which means <coughs> I call five up, I get an iterator, I call I dot next, I get a zero, and at this point it's waiting for me <coughs> to actually call it again. And the thing is, I can pass a value in. I can pass five. So what's going to happen then? What's going to come out? Oh, come on, five plus five. 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 <laughs> you can do it. <laughs> Ten. Yeah. And I can pass a hundred in. I get a hundred and five. Because it's waiting for the value that I pass in. And so I'm to C adds five loops. I can do a million. It's a million and five. I can do minus 50. It's minus 45. I can do not a number. That's null, that's not, not what I expected. <laughs> JavaScript. I can do infinity. That's also null. That's a mistake. I can do OMG JavaScript. <laughs> that's OMG JavaScript. Fine. <laughs> I saw that one coming. It's a lovely language. Right, so at this point, so this is perhaps the most useful um, application of the, the notion that you can pass values into the, the generator. I'm sure you're all thinking right now, though, hey, so instead of these silly numbers, what if we pass <coughs> in promises? I think there is another sit interview before we get to that, just to rest our brains, because this is getting heavy. This is said with bacon. Look at his eyes go, it's like <laughs> fluttering. It's so good. He likes that. Okay. No drooling, I think. Okay, that's it. Okay, so promises. That's actually a new feature in ES6, but we've been sort of using them uh, for a long while anyway as, as libraries. Um, a promise is sort of something that's going to happen. So if we have a promise object, we have a value that hasn't necessarily been calculated yet, but it's going to. Like, say, we get something from the internet, and we're going to get a, a string back with the contents of the thing we got from the internet. Um, and to do that, we can call a method called then on the promise. I'm going to, so I, I made a very, simple function here called unit, which just takes a value and returns a promise that's already realized with that value. So we're going to try and get that out of the promise. So if I've got a unit of five, that's a promise, and then I can call then on it with a function that will take the value. That can be considered a log. So that returns a promise, and at the end it prints five. And that's what we expected. It could be like 500 and so on. Yay. And also, uh, my ampersand trick works with promises as well. I can go ampersand unit 5, it will wait until the promise resolves, and then print the value 5, which would be useful. So let's write a generator for. Takes no arguments. It also unlocks a yield on a promise, a unit OMG. Just needs a couple of everyday words here, like OMG, uh, WTF, BBQ. Um, let's compile that and try running it. So R is promises. 
First thing we get out is a promise. You can see that uh, because it's already confirmed that the fulfillment of value is OMG. Um, and now my promises function is sitting there waiting for the promise to be resolved manually by me. It should be OMG, so I'm just going to pass in OMG. Seems obvious. And that makes it log OMG, and then it returns the next promise. It proceeds down the function, it gets to the next promise, WTF. So I could return, let's be clever, let's return string long instead. Long. Uh, so it logs long, and it returns the final promise, BBQ. And no need to be predictable, let's resolve it to not a number. That looks not a number, then we're done, don't we? No more promises. So that's nice. Um, sort of pointless um, for the moment. What we would like to do is we would like to add a function that automates this, that would take in an iterator of promises and wait for them, for them to resolve and put the result back. Let's look at that. Let's call that function run. Iter run is null. So that's a function or two arguments. The first is the iterator, and the second is because I want to, to recurse through this. I haven't figured, figured out a, a neat procedural way of, of writing this. I need to do a bit of recursion. So the value is going to start at null. That's a new feature in ES6 as well, by the way. That's default values. So if I call this function with one argument, the second argument is going to default to the value null for now. So I make a variable next, which is iter.nextval. So I'm being clever. You'll notice that, that the first time we call next on this auto generator, um, it doesn't expect a value. We sort of just call, call it the first one uh, as a primer. So now it's ready for us. Uh, and then if we are not yet done, next.value.then. That's to wait for the promise to finish. We need a function. It takes a result and then calls run again with the iterator and the result. So the result here is what came out of the promise. We call that, that becomes the val. Then we call iterator.next val, which now is, um, we've essentially told the generator what the next value turned out to be. After we waited for it to resolve, Let's try that. Let's call run promises. Whoop! OMG, told you to have QBQ. This is amazing. Do you know what? Do you notice what we did? It's not the prettiest thing, but we essentially wrote a sequence of promises, but it looks like synchronous code. It looks like code that is blocking for those uh, promises to, to resolve. But there's no sign of callback hell or, or then chains that look really ugly or anything. It's just this one keyword. If we have an asynchronous value, which is what a promise is, we just slap yield in front of it, and that will force this function until there's a value for it. And when the value is ready, we just use it. No callback hell. I think we killed it. This is actually. A bit amazing. Let's see if we can do something practical about this. So, I'd like to show you. Just show that up. Yeah, we're not out of time yet. Let's uh, have a look at a new uh, browser API. And this is not an ES6 thing, this is um, a new thing they put in browsers. So, you remember back in the old days uh, when you wanted to get uh, a resource out of a URL on the internet. So, you would use this thing called XML. HTTP request, which was invented by Microsoft back in the 90s, probably, something like that. Um, because at that time, the people at Microsoft couldn't imagine that you would want to fetch anything that wasn't an XML document. So it's called XML HTTP request. We call it XHR for short. And that's about the nastiest API you can imagine for getting a file off the internet. It's really dis disgusting. So this new thing 
is a function. That's called fetch. It takes a URL. In this case, I'm going to get a local file called pull out of text. And it returns a promise. And that's it. We can resolve that promise. It's a response object that has a method called. Um, no, wait, sorry. So I'm, I need to resolve that first. I get the result. That's the response object. And the response object has a method called, method called text, which returns a promise for the textual contents of that response. So getting that, oh, you can't read this. I had to increase the font size because of the amazing, um, the amazing screen. So that is the first paragraph of Fallout Equestria, which is my favorite book. It's, uh, it's um, a fan-made mashup of the two franchises, Fallout and My Little Pony. <laughs> and it's exactly as amazing as you think it is. <laughs> it's also the size of War and Peace, but you won't notice it's so amazing. So we just fetched that off the internet, this bit of code. Oh, we fetched that off my local machine, but that's close enough. That's a lot neater than um, XMLA should be requested if you've seen it. A lot neater. Um, and that's what, um, where the mechanism of promise is. So you can imagine where I'm going with this. We should be able to write a function, let's call it fallout. A generator function, get the response, yield on the fetch, fallout.text. Text is huge. Response.text. Console. Look text. So that will fetch the file and it will print it. The console. And I got a spurious view there. You should have noticed that, shouldn't you? Shame on you. So um, incidentally, the rules of live coding is I'm guaranteed to to make a mistake. It's on you to spot that mistake and correct me because obviously I'm testing you. <laughs> it's not me making stupid mistakes, that wouldn't happen. So I'm just checking if you're paying attention. If you believe that. Uh, so I can run Fallout now. Calling my, my run function that I write and my new Fallout function. That's the text. That seems to work. But um, this sucks a bit. I mean, I am doing, amazingly, I'm, I'm doing a synchronous I.O. like it was synchronous I.O., which is pretty cool. But what I would like to do is I would like to generalize this function. I would like to have a function that just takes a URL and then returns the result of that instantly. So I would like to make a function that, that does all these steps but doesn't actually include what I want to do with it, because I'd like to, to be able to generalize this into something where I can just do that <coughs> later. I want just the bit that fetches, not the bit that prints. And to get there, I need to extend my run function a bit. For one thing, I need to return a promise of the eventual uh, return value, which means that I'm going to add uh, a new argument done, which is going to uh, default of promise that defer, which is something I can use to resolve a promise later. So let's see. Next is done. I want to uh, keep passing it the done <coughs> object. And I need an else clause. If we are done, then instead of continuing the iteration, I want to Resolve the promise with next up value. So if I'm returning a value from, from the generator function instead of yielding a value, this is what we get. That's the value that comes out. And I also need to return the promise from the run function. So the idea is the run function now returns a promise that I can just wait on to get the final value. So I can write very concisely this time, because you know how it works, so I'm just going to... 
cut corners. Um, mutability is that first, but that's fine. It takes the URL argument, then our yields on yielding on fetch URL.txt. This is the same thing, except without the intermediate variables. I wait for the fetch. Um, I call text on the, res the, the response object, and I use a mat, and I return that, the result of the yield. So that should get us uh, run fetch text data node text. Uh, oh, what's this? Oh, that's private. I'm sorry, that was something I was writing from. <laughs> 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 this is, so this is the, the Mary C fanfic. Um, I just sort of changed the names a bit. <laughs> and, right, well, that was embarrassing, but at least we now know that we have generalized it because that was fetching something else. And here's one word. That's it. Cool. Now, let's see. Very quickly at the end. Um, I want to show you that this is not just for actual promises. As long as there's the then method, we can do some interesting things, like um, here we've got a function called things. We've got um, an object called ponies with two ponies in it. Uh, think of I and rainbow dash. I'm going to show you. Uh, and we've got this thing function which wants to tell us that these two ponies are friends, because that is what ponies do. They are friends. And so we get Bonus dot dash, we get bonus dot pi, and we return dash is friends with pi. Let's try that. Let's run that. Uh, sorry. Let's run that. And it thinks. Rainbow dash is friends with pinky pie, obviously. So far, so good. Now, rainbow dash, as it happens, is also friends with twilight sparkle. So let's do that. Get twi, components dot twi, and say dash is friends with twi. What's going to happen now? Well, for one thing, you'll notice that there is no twi property in, in my ponies object, <coughs> which means that JavaScript's type system is going to catch this at compile time. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not really. Um, so JavaScript doesn't have a type system, so we would expect that JavaScript's runtime would throw an exception, because there is no twi property, that's an error, that we detected at runtime. Yeah. <laughs> Rainbow Dash is friends with undefined. <laughs> because obviously, if, if you try to get a property out of an object that doesn't have that property, you get the value undefined back, because that's very useful. Uh, what I would like to do here is I would like to handle this. Uh, ideally, I would handle this with errors, but for now, for brevity, I'm going to try and handle this so that if I get that sort of error, at least I won't print the wrong thing. I would rather just print nothing. So I'm going to make me a little a value here. I'm going to have a function called maybe, which takes the value and returns something thenable, by which I mean something that has a then method, which takes a callback function for the value, and if the value I pass in is not null, and notice because uh, this is not a Douglas Crookford violation, this is intentional, I'm using double equals, or double disequals in this case instead of triple equals. In the case of, of comparing it to null, that literally means is this null or undefined, which is what I'm after. So if the value is not null, null, undefined, I want to return <coughs> functional mal. Essentially, I want to call the callback function with the value that we, we have put in this maybe. And if not, I just want to return null. And I would like to just have a look at this. Maybe log five. Maybe it's not defined. Like that. And we can go maybe log five, then i is 
so maybe I'm six. But I guess it's a six. But if maybe the first maybe is none, then nothing happens instead. So the chain stops if one of these values is none, is the idea. And I can take advantage of this by having a function called prop, which takes the key out of an object, and the idea is to get that key out of the object, but return a maybe. Uh, a maybe of object key. So if that is undefined, I will get um, a maybe value that is undefined, which means the callback will never get called. But if not, everything's fine. Things should work. So I change my things function slightly. Set up bonus dot dash, I yield on prop dash pennies and pi is yield prop pi pennies and pi at the end there. And I run that. And since Raymond Dash has been friends with Pinkie Pie, like previously, but now we're going through the maybe. So if I try and get y, exciting, nothing happens. So that's very marginally better than doing the wrong thing. Uh, we could extend this quite easily with an actual error message, which might be useful, but that's not part of this exercise. If I've done and we're going to summarize. We got this async interface in JavaScript now. Uh, this is what the promise looks like. This is, oh, I'm sorry, this is tiny. This is uh, TypeScript notation. Then is a method on an, an async object. It takes a function. This function takes um, an A, which is the value that's going to come out. A is the type of the value that's going to come out of the promise, and it returns a promise of that value. And this function also returns a promise of that value. I've been doing things like returning null, but that's immaterial, pretend that I was doing it correctly. Um, actually, I added the unit method as well. That's the way of, of just getting the value into the promise. That takes a value and it return, returns a promise that's already resolved to that value. So this is sort of our entire interface for, for making promises. Um, let's review that. So we can chain the operations using them. Uh, we get the values out of the promise, and we can keep going um, through chains of promises using the then method. And then we can use uh, yield and generators and our little trick with the run function to get rid of the then chain so you can write code that looks uh, synchronous. No callback code in sight. We can do this with anything which has a then method. It's not just promises, as you just saw with my little maybe thing. Can you imagine a world without callbacks? How nice would that be? Any of you done Node.js programming? So sorry for you. If you see Node.js programs, they look atrocious. I'm going to show you a bit later. But this is how it could look like. This is doing completely asynchronous I.O. It reads completely in like asynchronous I.O. You write it that way, you think of it that way, except for the yield keywords. So this is a new program that will read two files, beta text, beta text, concatenate them, and write back out a file for base for text. This completely synchronous isn't actually. I think that's rather clever. This is actually just like in Haskell. Any of you know Haskell? Uh, some hands going like half up. <laughs> it's good. Haskell is an interesting language. It's been around for a while, and, and it's got sort of the same thing going on. You got a do block there, and you read a file, you put it in A, you read a file, you put it in B, you write the file back out, uh, A plus B. <laughs> Same thing. Haskell is interesting. Haskell is all callbacks. It's got this thing going where no side effects are allowed. So if you have a function, the function itself isn't allowed to do things like print of the screen, or, or write a file, or even read a file. <coughs> um, every time you call a function with a certain value, the value that comes out has to be the same. Uh, for any input, the output must be the same every time you call that function, which is uh, the no side effects allowed bit. It's, it, that's called pure functional programming. And, and Haskell, Haskell is completely pure. You're not allowed to do any sort of I.O., which might seem sort of useless, 
But uh, the thing is, you can still do I.O. except all side effects must be async. You can do things like um, at the end of your conceptually at the end of your program, you return a value. That means please go and do this I.O. operation, then call me back on this callback function. Which is exactly what can send things like Node.js. Haskell, 25 years ago, before they actually solved this problem, Haskell looked like this. Well, this is JavaScript, this is Node, this is actually callback up. It's the same program, except it's disgusting and messy. And Haskell was actually even worse. I wouldn't even try and explain to you what they were actually doing, but it was even nastier than this. So they had to come up with a solution, and they've had 25 years to do this. So eventually, one man solved this problem. This man is Philip Woodman. He slew the beast. He found this amazing solution for how to, to manage um, this sort of program in Haskell very neatly to do asynchronous I.O. And that's called Monads. Who's heard of Monads? A couple of you, I can see you snickering, you won't admit it. So the thing is, Monads, they're, they're famous, they're very famous for being impossible to understand. They're also famous for being like a burrito, which is a famous Monad tutorial that, well, We've got a few of them. They're like burritos, they're like spacesuits, and none of those metaphors actually make sense. Uh, so they're, they're quite legendary for being impossible to, to actually understand. So I won't actually try and make you understand that. And I know you're thinking right now, oh my god, she's just going to do like a minute to short, and this is going to be horrible. But I won't. Uh, this is what a minute looks like in Haskell, though. A minute is, is something for which, if there is a type M, you can implement a function return. That looks like this, a function from type A to M of A, and a function bind. This is how Haskell people spell bind. Greater than, greater than, equal. It make, makes perfect sense if, if you know Haskell. It'd be nice to pretend. And that's a, uh, that's a function from a minute of A. Uh, that takes a function A to minute of B. That returns a minute of B. And if I translate this into normal language, um, this is the monad in TypeScript notation. I had to change the, um, the names of the, of the methods because return is a reserved word in JavaScript, and greater than, greater than, equals is actually not something you can name a function. So I call them unit and then. Does that look familiar? Oh, I'm so excited, I don't see where I'm going. Uh, does that look familiar to you? This is our ASIC interface from previous year. This is the, literally a promise. That's what it is. You got the unit method, you got the then method. If you got that, you got a monad. You've seen the IO monad from Haskell. It's promises in JavaScript. The media monad, or my peculiar implementation of it, is a thing in Haskell too that is used for dealing with um, that sort of thing. This is monad comprehension in Haskell. The two block and sort of waiting for the monadic operations to finish. This is monad comprehension in JavaScript. That's the run function, that's our generator function. We're making promises, we're yielding on them. That's monad comprehension. So, so continuation passing style and a couple of other things. But let's not get into that. So, I'm not going to do a monad tutorial because you don't need one at this point. You already know perfectly well what monads are. They're promises. And you get monad comprehension out of the, uh, out of the generator functions, if you've got that little other function. So fortunately, there are no Haskell people in the audience, or they will be going, well, uh, uh, well actually, uh, there's a bit more to being a monad. And that's you have to fulfill the, the three monad laws. Left side entity, right side entity, Associativity. Promises do that. I shan't dwell on them if you're interested. These are the laws expressed in JavaScript. That's triple equals in, in cool math Unicode uh, stuff. So, three more numbers have to be there. Let's not dwell on them. They usually are. That's it. So, if you like my run function and want to go play with it, uh, don't use the, the run function, it's, it's a bit simplistic. There's this library on NPM called Cole. It's on GitHub right there. 
It's just the same thing, it's just error handling, hello world better. Check it out, play with it, it's so awesome. Uh, for completeness, if you like this, but you think you maybe like the Haskell syntax better, but you don't want to actually go all in and do Haskell, you want to stay like doing JavaScript in the browser and stuff, there's a compliant JavaScript language called PureScript. This is that program from previously, written in PureScript. This compiles to nice, tidy JavaScript. And it's pretty much like Haskell. You got all, all the funny bits, the monads and the applicatives and the functors, the pre-functors, the um, psychohistomorphic preformorphisms, that's <coughs> like Haskell. It's very cool. Anyway, PureScript might be worth looking into. You might want to stay on dry land with a code library instead. That one. That's it. So sorry. Uh, as an apology for teaching you monads without you realizing, here's Sid with Peter. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh yeah, and actually, if, if you go online on that URL, you will find my slides. The editor works, so you can play with it. That's all. Thank you.